Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Uh, this is a very exciting Sunday for us. During the late service, there are going to be eight uh, young men and women that are going to profess their faith. They're going to confess their faith to the world. And so today during our service, we are going to reflect on uh, Psalm 1, which is the introduction to the book of Psalms, which is the devotional book of the Bible. And it is going to teach us how to live faithfully uh, in that confession. And so that will be the base of our meditation. Uh, I want to, to uh, bring to your attention two things. Uh, several, well, it's probably been several months ago, we decided that uh, everything that goes on here, as you know, is, is intended to form you towards towards a faithful Christian. And so part of that formation process, we decided it would be helpful to pass, to, to bring back passing around the offering plates. It's a visible sign uh, that, that there is nothing that you are withholding from God. You are giving your gifts to him. Even for the children, they see, they see mom and dad uh, giving, giving their gifts to God. And so it's, so it's a helpful thing to pass around the plate, but I realize that many of you give online. And so to help to help you continue to be formed in this way. In the back of the church, you can pick up one of these, uh, one of these little cards that I would invite you also to, uh, to drop in the offering plate if you so choose, that simply says, I give online. And so it's, a, it's still part of that formation process to recognize, hey, I am dedicating something to the Lord. Along with that, one more other change is, one, one more change is that uh, instead of putting your attendance cards in the uh, offering plate, uh, after, the, after the ushers bring forward the offering, they are going to circle back around to those middle aisles to collect the attendance cards. So if you could not put your attendance card in the offering plate, fill it out during the offertory, pass it to the center aisles, and, uh, and the ushers will collect it. And if that doesn't make sense, hopefully someone sitting next to you understood it. God's blessings on your worship. We begin with a call to worship.
We now sing our opening hymn, We Are Called to Stand Together, LSB 828. And notice that our choir will be singing stanza three. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our hymn of praise.
with you? Let us pray. O oh God, you have commanded us to love you above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. Grant us the spirit to think and do what is pleasing in your sight, that our faith in you may never waver and our love for one another may not falter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading comes from Leviticus chapter 19. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you to our adult choir. We now read Psalm 1 responsibly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Our epistle reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we, night, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the glory of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you, believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a man manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Alleluia. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how? Is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We ask all our children to come forward for the children's message.
Good morning. How are you all this morning? Good. I have a question. Is it wrong to hit somebody? No. Yeah. Yes, it is. Is it wrong to say mean things about somebody? Yeah, that's wrong too. Is it wrong to take things that aren't ours? Yeah, that's wrong. We don't want to do that. So as we do all these things, it, so you know these things are wrong, but do you still do them sometimes? Yeah. So we say, hey, I'm not supposed to do this. We know we're not supposed to do this, but sometimes we still do them anyway. And so one of the challenges for us living as Christians is to live the way we know is right. And so I have some really good news for you. I don't know if you noticed all the, did you notice there's a new color hanging in church today? Red. red. Where do you see some red? Very good. Yeah, all over the place. What, what symbol do you see there on, on the uh, pulpit? What is that? What is that? A dove. So the red reminds us always that the Holy Spirit is coming. And so it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the confession to help us say that Jesus is Lord, that we should live in, as good children. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength and the power to do that. So that's what we're celebrating today. And there's something really cool happening at the late service. And that front pew right there are going to be eight young men and women who are going to make a big, big promise that they are going to follow Jesus before everything. And so we're going to pray this morning for them that they are able to live in that promise and to keep their promise, okay? Can you please fold your hands and bow your heads and pray with me? You can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for your Holy Spirit, which you have sent into me. Please be with the ninth graders and give them the Holy Spirit so that they may live in the promises they speak. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up. You can return to your seats. And our uh, service continues with the hymn of the day, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a very exciting day for the members of the manual. As I've mentioned to you, during the late service, there are going to be eight young men and women that are, that are going to be sitting in this front pew, and they're going to make a confession of their faith. They're going to confess the faith that has been taught to them over many years. They're con going to confess that Jesus is Lord. They're going to confess the faith that was planted and rooted in them when they were baptized. So these eight young people stand as a sign of the Holy Spirit at work, continuing his church on into the next generation. It's really exciting. It's, it's something really great for us to look forward to. But it also reminds us that the confession that they are making is also very challenging. So I don't know if you remember back to the, to the time when you had to stand before the congregation and make your own confession. In a word, probably many of you were nervous. And if you don't remember that, maybe you can think to a recent time when you actually had to confess your faith, to speak your faith to someone uh, that you know, a friend, a family member, a spouse, a loved one, and you've had to confess your faith to them. And it can be kind of a nerve-wracking experience, not just standing in front of people, but confessing your faith, because there are all these fears that kind of seem to descend on you. Am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to lead them astray? Am I going to embarrass myself? So there are all of these fears, but I would contend also that one of the things about making this confession, one of the terrifying things about making this confession is actually the confession itself. So these, these eight young men and women are going to stand up here and I'm going to ask them a series of questions and they're going to make that con confession and I want to share with you just two of the questions that I'm going to ask them. So the first is this. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit even to death? by which they will respond, I do by the grace of God. And I will ask them again, do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Again, they will respond, I do by the grace of God. And notice what these two questions align. They align not just what you know. They align not just what you speak, the confession you make, but also the way you live. And so that can be the ultimate terrifying thing about making a confession to someone, is if you tell someone that you believe in Jesus, now all of a sudden they're going to look for proof in your life. So Jesus says not to talk bad about others, and they're going to see do you believe that teaching? Do you live according to it? And as we all know, it can be really, really challenging for us to align our confession with how we actually live, to align what we know with what we do. You've all heard the story about a church not too far from here. And the church had a problem with horse flies. And it was, it was terrible. They were the really big horse flies. And when they would bite you, it would leave a whelp and it hurt something awful. And you know, it made, it made coming to church miserable. The children would squeal. And the trustees, really, they tried to do everything to rid the church of these horse flies. And nothing worked. So finally they came to the old pastor and said, Pastor, do you have any idea for what we can do to get rid of these horse flies? The pastor thought for a moment and he said, yeah, let's confirm them. And it was amazing. The very next Sunday, the horse flies were all gone. <laughs> I wasn't looking for negative feedback. 
But the reason it's funny to some of you is that we all recognize this tension between what we confess and how we live. And we realize that that can be quite a struggle. And so thanks be to God, in the book of Psalms, it recognizes that this is not just a new tension for us as, as modern people, that this is something that God's people have been struggling with for such a long, long time. And so in the book of Psalms, the, the, as I said at the beginning of service, which is really the prayer book of the Bible, the devotional book of the Bible, the first Psalm teaches us how to live devotionally how to align our confession with our life. And so it's the second verse of the psalm there where the psalm gives us language for solving this tension. And it says, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. The psalmist says, is, is not blessing the man who knows something or who confesses something, but rather the one is blessed who delights in it. And that can be a really difficult struggle for us. And perhaps part of the reason for that is because we see this tension uh, between what we confess and what we know, and, and part of the way we try to solve that tension is we just rest solely on what we know and what we think. And so we treat our faith something like an exam. I've studied for the exam, I've passed the exam, I've got a good grade on the exam, I don't need to worry about it any longer. Or we treat our faith like maintenance on a car. I've changed my oil, I don't need to worry about the car for another 3,000 miles. But the truth is that in our faith, there is no fixed middle position. You're either moving towards God or you are moving away from him. There is no stationary position. And this can be, this can be struggle, uh, a, a struggle, and I'm not talking about feelings because there are times when you feel very distant from God or you feel that you're moving away from him, and, and those feelings are difficult to interpret. But what I am talking about is when people say, I'm doing just fine on my own apart from the, apart from the community, or my faith is, is just fine, I don't need to do anything more with it. That sense of complacency is almost certainly a sign that you are moving away from God. You see that? There is no fixed middle position. And so the psalmist calls us to delight in this law of the Lord. And so a better way to think about our faith is perhaps to compare it to your living room. Your living room is always getting dirty, whether you use it or not, and especially if you have young children, then it gets dirty at a much faster pace than everyone else's living room, right? And the living room and the dirt and dust that collects all over it is like the dirt and dust that collects in our life as we live out in the world. And if it is not given any attention, that dust will collect into dust bunnies that will eventually blow across your floor like tumbleweeds unless you give it intentional time and clean it up. Unless our lives are constantly reaching towards and leaning towards the things that clean us up, that make us holy, that purify us. Unless we spend time cleaning the living room, it will never be clean on its own. And so the psalmist is asking us, is calling us not just to confess something, but to delight in that confession. And there's this beautiful image that sits right at the center of the psalm in, in verse 3, which it compares the one who delights in the psalm to this tree. And I want you to notice a couple of things about this tree. First off, no tree ever decided where it was going to be planted. No tree ever said to itself, 
boy, this looks like a nice place to set down my roots. Nobody's going to cut me down here. Every tree had to be planted, either by a neighboring parent tree as an, as an act of God, or by someone who is caring for the land. And so it is for you. You have been planted in this place. This confession that you speak, that you know, that you believe, has been given to you. It has taken root in your baptism. The other thing I want you to notice is that because the tree has roots, it is stationary. The psalmist intentionally contrasts this image of the tree from everything else in the psalm. What the image that lies before it is, is the man who is walking and moving and living out in the world, and the, the, the image after it is the chaff that is blowing in the wind. Everything else in the psalm has movement besides this one tree. And that teaches us a lot about delight. Because you see, you move out in the world, and the world is always in motion. There's always the next thing to do, always the next soccer practice to get to, always the next thing to check off your to-do list, always the next project to get done at work, always the next school assignment to do, always moving on and on and on and on, always in motion, never stopping, but delight takes time. If you want to enjoy Yosemite National Park, you don't enjoy it in your car going 70 miles an hour down the highway. You pull over, you get out, you stand and you gaze speechless at the beauty of the, of the scenery that lies before you. Delight takes time. So that's my challenge for you all as this tension that we experience between confession and living in delight. And I also want you to notice what happens to the tree that has been planted here. What happens to you as you've been planted, as you delight in the law of the Lord and the story of God? The tree visibly changes. It's vibrant. It shares its beautiful colors with the world. It produces fruit in season. And so it is with you. So don't just confess this faith that has been given to you, but delight in it. Like a tree that drinks deeply from the streams of living water. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds and the one true faith that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We stand to confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
You may be seated as we sing our offertory, and as our offering is being collected, please fill out your attendance cards for the ushers to collect them in the side aisles. Please stand for prayer. Let us pray for those people whom we know who call out to God, for the church around the world, and for all people in their various needs. For those near and dear to us who are in sickness, whose families are in turmoil, or who face hardships of body and spirit. Today we especially name before you, Lord, Dorothy Lelf, Samantha Earhart, and all those we name in our hearts and minds now. That God would grant them blessings, strength, and renewal of hope. Let us pray to the Lord. Grant that they find God's answers to their prayers to be like refreshing streams of water. Let us pray for those who wield power through the corporations, organizations, and institutions of our nation that God would guide them each day. Grant that they find delight in the law of the Lord and pro produce God-pleasing decisions, fruit in its seasons. Let us pray for people who languish under the counsel of the wicked, who are oppressed by corrupt governments and society and are ridiculed by thoughtless scoffers, that God would guide the church to surround them with caring people and the news of the gospel. Grant that they find relief and courage, that they endure in their distress and be like leaves that do not wither. Let us pray for people who are dealing with overwhelming catastrophe in this turbulent world, that God would open their hearts and minds to rely on his changeless promises and grace. Grant that God strengthen them and turn them from their fear to rely on his sustaining love that they be not like chaff blowing in the wind, but become like trees planted by streams of water. These and any other things you would have us ask of you, Heavenly Father, grant to us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that all for whom we pray may join us to rejoice as faithful trees, 
rich in love, joy, and peace. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. A few brief words of announcements, really just to pray for our confirmands as they take on the daunting task of confessing their faith before God in this assembly of people. So pray for them as they do that in the rest of their lives as well. And the other thing would be a, a sausage supper next Sunday, November 5th. And so uh, keep, keep your calendars clear of that so you can all uh, come and have, so, have some dinner with us. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and receive the Lord's blessing. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Splendor and Honor, LSB 950. <laughs>